This video is a progressive meditation on the 2024 election. It's meant to address the criticism I've received from several listeners to the UNFTR podcast for being too hard on Joe Biden. See, there seems to be a growing sense that I'm willing to burn the barn to get to the nails, that I'm an accelerationist. And I've been reminded of my responsibility as a leftist with an audience, small as it may be, not to contribute to any narrative that might support Donald Trump's return to the presidency. And this is a big debate going on right now. So I'm here to state my case as we head further into the election madness and to tell you why the Biden presidency has been a disaster for the progressive movement and to tell you that you can still vote for him in November with a clear conscience if you're indeed a progressive. <gasps> the motto of our show is to meet people where they are. So allow me to suggest that we're all actually in the same place, meaning we've already lost. So the goal is to clear the air so we can build some bridges, get on the same page, and start building coalitions for the future. UNFTR. So let's start at the end and work our way back. It's safe to assume that Trump and Biden are going to be the major party nominees, right? If the third party candidates are on the ballot in your state, then we're looking at Cornell West, Jill Stein, and Robert Kennedy Jr. There's also the possibility that No Labels puts forward a ticket, but they've only secured ballot access in 13 states so far. So, again, all things being equal, come Election Day, we've got Biden versus Trump and three outside candidates in West, Stein, and Kennedy. And let me say unequivocally, before we move on, a Trump presidency would be the most catastrophic of all options because there are no other options outside of the duopoly. There's no version of the multiverse where my favorite candidate, Cornell West, is president, for example. So again, Donald Trump is the worst outcome. But the animus toward my criticism of Joe Biden would seem to imply that any such critique is a tacit show of support for Trump, and nothing could be further from the truth. Tell me a story, tell me a story, tell me a story, remember what you said, you promised me you said you would. Let's dig into some history. The Compromise of 1850 was intended to stave off the dissolution of the Union, yet it merely deepened the split between free and slaveholding states. And a handful of important events over the next decade from the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the caning of Charles Sumner to John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry and the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 contributed to the formation of the Confederacy and multiple declarations of secession something that's suddenly back in fashion again. What are you, fucking stupid? The decade following the Compromise of 1850 literally broke the country apart. And when people talk about the conditions that led to the Civil War, I mean, this is the seminal decade. But an overlooked fact from this era is that it also broke apart the dominant political party in the country, the Whig Party. See, the Whig Party was established for the express purpose of fighting Andrew Jackson's authoritarianism. Jackson, who served as president from 1829 to 37, gave the United States its first real taste of autocracy. The ruthless leader slaughtered native peoples, wielded the veto to govern from the executive branch, argued with and disposed of his vice president, filled cabinet positions with unqualified sycophants, and threatened the use of the military on states that bucked his will. Hence, Trump's decision to hang Jackson's portrait in the Oval Office. You dick! The aggrieved professional political class responded with the creation of a new political party to oppose the man many referred to as King Andrew. And while figures such as Daniel Webster and Henry Clay attempted to give shape to the Whig platform, they ran up against the buzzsaw that was slavery. Northern and Southern Whigs split along pro- and anti-slavery lines and folded into the Democratic and Republican parties, respectively. And we've been living with this duopoly ever since. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. The Whigs learned the hard way that if all you have to unite a party is the opposition, then you build on sand. And so without much of a platform to stand on, the Democrats are hoping that Trump is enough to unite us all in November. Again. As for the non-MAGA Republicans, they don't even have to buy into the cult of personality that is Trump. They just have to look the other way. But dig this. I live in the 3rd Congressional District in New York the famed George Santos district. If the mail to my house is any preview of the battle ahead, then there's an interesting twist. The candidates for the special election are conservative Republican Mozzie Pillip and conservative Democrat Tom Swazi. I'm in a very purple district. 
Now, Tom Suozzi held the seat before vacating it in the Santos election. Philip's message is simply that Suozzi voted with Biden 100% of the time. That's all the mail that I get. Meanwhile, Suozzi's attack ads aren't about Trump. They're about abortion. So the calculus leading into the election is pretty cynical so far. The overturning of Roe v. Wade was enough to animate the core base of Democratic voters in the midterm elections. But whether it will be enough to persuade voters to turn out in a special election remains to be seen. So I think it's fair to view this district as a bellwether of sorts. The obvious omission of anti-Trump literature tells me that this isn't a strategic lock in a purple district. And so the swing states are going to be really fascinating. Anti-Biden sentiment might be more significant than anti-Trump sentiment at this moment in time. Right now, Trump is crushing Nikki Haley in the polls. Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley. And if she gets trounced in her own state of South Carolina, Trump will ride that messaging through Super Tuesday and to its inevitable conclusion. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party has to notch some serious victories beyond stimulus bills and government spending from two years ago in what is already a de facto lame duck session. Running on abortion might not be enough, considering the Democratic Party doesn't have an answer beyond, we just have to wait for more Supreme Court justices to die. The midterms might have been punishment for Roe v. Wade, but you can't just run against something that has already happened. If that's the case, you're asking voters to do some serious actuarial math. I mean, Thomas and Alito are the oldest at 75 and 73 respectively, so it's conceivable that one of them dies in the next five years. But both? There's a 6-3 majority right now, so at best we pick up a seat. Now, we already know that Biden won't stack the court, so that means we're banking on taking the presidency and both houses with a supermajority to codify abortion into law? So that brings us back to the DNC calculus. Biden beat him once, he'll beat him again. Here's the issue. Trump was an incumbent who gave the country extreme anxiety and bungled the response to the global pandemic. Now Biden's the incumbent, and people are still anxious given the inflationary pressures that U.S. households have been under. Not many voters are going to blame Trump for that. And Biden has taken the youth and ethnic minority vote for granted whether establishment Democrats want to admit it or not. La, 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 la. So let's talk about these votes that Biden's taking for granted right now. Here are a few vital statements of fact according to Pew Research. Number one, in 2020, Four of every 10 votes for Biden were black, Asian, or Hispanic. Number two, voters between 18 and 29 favored Biden by 24 points. Three, nearly half of Biden voters were under the age of 50 compared to 39% for Trump. And lastly, Trump made gains among millennials and ethnic minorities in 2020 compared to 2016. What the fuck happened? Hey. The Democratic Party loves to talk about diversity. It likes to think of itself as the youth party as well. So let's talk about the things that matter to young and ethnic voters. First off, home ownership is a huge issue, and the stats aren't great. Home prices are stubbornly high along with interest rates. Home ownership rates have fallen since the pandemic highs, and they still haven't recovered to anywhere near where they were prior to the Great Recession. Student debt remains at crisis levels, with recent relief efforts going mostly to service workers. But it remains to be seen what the impact will be on black student debt holders who are disproportionately overburdened by this kind of debt. It's all part of the toxic mixture that has led to the highest household debt ratio in U.S. history. Now, these economic pressures show up in the polling data. As PBS reports, quote, just 50 percent of black adults said they approve of Biden in a December poll by the Associated Press NORC Center for Public Affairs. That's compared with 86% in July 2021, with the gap fueling concerns about his re-election prospects, end quote. Now, the fact that Trump actually made gains among millennials between 2016 and 2020 should also be of paramount concern to the Biden administration, considering half of the popular vote came from people under 50 years of age. So these are pure economic realities that are suppressing Biden's favorability ratings among these key demographics. Now, there are softer issues as well, meaning indirect issues. They're not soft. They're just indirect issues that are also meaningful. And abortion is currently one of them. But like I said, you can't build a campaign on something that has already happened unless you have a definitive plan to address it moving forward. Now, it hasn't stopped the Biden-Harris campaign from making abortion access a central issue in the re-election campaign. 
It was the centerpiece in a recent rally in Virginia, and the campaign is pushing materials criticizing Trump and the Republicans for restricting access in several states. But if you read the materials and the releases, I defy you to find an actual plan. And the Virginia rally, by the way, was interrupted by protesters calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, which leads to yet another problematic aspect of Biden's re-election bid. Forget Sleepy Joe. The nickname Genocide Joe is already sticking among angry young liberal voters, and it's not going away anytime soon. Bringing about a ceasefire in Gaza and developing a humanitarian plan for displaced Palestinians is now officially a Joe Biden problem. Young liberal voters and black Americans alike are aligned on this issue because the genocide in Gaza is playing out in quarters the administration cannot control. I mean, it's being live streamed on social media and there's almost nothing that can be done to halt the images from escaping Gaza, no matter how hard the mainstream media tries to minimize it. And black voters in America, by the way, see America arming and aiding what they perceive to be a white nation in the destruction of brown people. The same brown people who were very vocal in their defense of the Black Lives Matter movement. So all of this has real alignment and we have to consider the impact of that. Biden's also taking an increasingly hard line on border crossings, signaling that he's willing to shut down the border in the dispute between Texas and his administration. And all this is going to do is make the situation look more out of control and him less in control. And that plays directly into the hands of Republican strategists who are pouring accelerants on the immigration fire and tying up border funds with foreign aid and other spending measures to hamstring the administration. So in addition to navigating the war in Gaza, Biden has to develop a plan at the border that doesn't look inhumane like Trump's was all in a matter of a few months. But he's going to have to do even more than that. This administration has to put forward an aggressive economic relief plan for the working class that incorporates down ballot initiatives to convince Americans that there's more on the board than just waiting for funds from omnibus bills from two years ago to finally pay off. Otherwise, Biden's maybe more Millard Fillmore than he is Jimmy Carter. So where does this leave progressives? Why am I saying the election has already been lost? And how can I also say that you should go ahead and vote for Biden with a clear conscience? I have so many questions! The fear of another Trump term is palpable and growing as Trump continues to clear hurdles toward the GOP nomination. And no matter how much of a slam dunk most of the charges against citizen Donald appear to be, I think it's hard for any of us to imagine him actually doing time in prison or, at a minimum, being disqualified. And even if Trump is somehow prevented from actually running, Biden is polling statistically even with Nikki Haley, so there's no clear path to victory on that front either. When it comes to anger among liberal Democrats toward progressives like me who are critical of Biden, you have to understand where we're coming from. The things that made the Biden platform palatable, if not popular, were progressive in nature and contributed toward the turnout that made a difference in 2020. Three years ago, progressives did our job. We watched as the DNC circled the proverbial wagons around a man that previously sought and lost the nomination, once in 88 and once in 2008, because the establishment was threatened by the surge in support for Bernie Sanders. And one by one, the other avatars of the establishment fell in line to prevent Bernie from running the table in the primary. First, Bernie took Iowa. I mean, he trounced Biden, but other delegates were later reapportioned. Then he took New Hampshire and Nevada, and a chill went down the spine of the DNC, which is metaphor because the DNC is, of course, spineless. And so Yang, Bennett, Patrick, and Steyer jumped ship to support Biden. And when Bernie still put up admirable numbers in South Carolina, even after Clyburn threw his formidable base behind Biden, Klobuchar and Buttigieg fell in line before Super Tuesday, with the latter leveling an all-out rhetorical assault on Bernie, the man he credited as his inspiration for getting into politics. I was into Bernie before it was cool. And then Bloomberg and Warren followed shortly thereafter, with Warren petulantly holding back her endorsement until the death of Bernie's campaign was a certainty. And so we fell in line. We backed Joe Biden in his third bid to secure the nomination and pulled the lever for him to prevent a second Trump turn. And in return, we made a few demands that he promised to address. The Green New Deal, expanded health care coverage, $15 minimum wage, student debt erasure, and foreign wars, continue the direct child tax credit payments, extended parental leave, and greater protection for workers. 
in other words, the really popular shit that got him elected in the first place. Damn! Now, we understood that most, not all, but most of these things were attainable with the Democratic majority, but he would have to act quickly and deliberately. Now, we knew Medicare for all was off the table, but everything else was pretty much within reach. And here's where the lines of communication begin to break down. Most people assume that all politicians lie to get elected. So when Biden made strides in certain areas, some progressives were stunned and happily surprised. But let's be honest, when he and Bernie had their fucking kumbaya moment, our demands were clear. You don't get the support of our guy unless you fight for these things. And now that we're three years into it, we have receipts. And while Trump poses a grave threat to our democracy, to marginalized people and the planet, Joe Biden is still the president, and we'd like a word. The Green New Deal didn't happen. We got a ton of investments into clean energy initiatives that we'll take time to implement, and it's a great start. But we've still done nothing to slow emissions in the meantime, and in fact, we've doubled down on fossil fuel production and opened up new areas for fossil fuel exploration. That wasn't the deal. There were 29 million uninsured people in the United States in 2019. In 2022, that figure fell to 25.6 million. Let me ask you, is that enough for you? Are we supposed to settle for this? Now, sure, Biden extended provisions to cover prescription drugs for seniors and some other really important things, but millions of people were dropped from Medicaid in 2023. So by the time the dust settles, it's likely that all of those gains were reversed despite the fact that unemployment remains incredibly low. So let me ask you this, what happens when there's a spike in unemployment? That wasn't the deal. Biden issued an order to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, but just for federal workers in 2021. And in 2022, it was blocked by a federal court. The federal minimum wage for all remains $7.25. That wasn't part of the deal. Several organizations and policy groups demonstrated how the Biden administration can eliminate all student debt lawfully without going through Congress. And instead, Biden chose to leverage pandemic relief rules to eliminate up to 10,000 for all debt and up to 20,000 in certain cases. And it got shot down. Since then, the administration has done a workaround to eliminate several billion dollars, but for most student debt holders, they don't qualify. That wasn't part of the deal. We asked Biden to end all foreign wars, and he did pull us out of Afghanistan, and he should be commended for that. Unless, of course, you live in Afghanistan under Taliban rule, in which case you might want a word with him. Since then, we've armed Ukraine and Israel for their war efforts, sold arms to nearly every country in the world, and strategically bombed a handful of nations when we needed to remind everyone of what we're capable of. Oh, and we're on the brink of an all-out war in the Middle East and Northern Africa. Essentially, he just outsourced war. That wasn't part of the deal. We asked him to continue the direct child tax credit payments, and he ended them. That wasn't part of the deal. We asked for extended parental leave. Didn't happen. That wasn't the deal. We asked for greater protection for workers, and Biden did make it easier to unionize. So that's great. That was part of the deal. Also, union membership declined in 2023 anyway. So when you ask progressives to choose the lesser of two evils, this is the mental tally we do. And when you're surprised by our tepid response to the election and call our criticisms of Biden irresponsible, maybe now you understand. Or maybe you don't, but at least you know. Now here's why you should be both vocal in your criticism of Biden and feel free to go right ahead and vote for him in November. Because we already lost the election, and we lost it a long time ago. We lost the election when none of our demands from prior years even made it onto the ballot. I mean, I love Cornell West, and he still has my vote because I live in Blue York. But his candidacy is a true protest, and his campaign is muddled and directionless. If RFK's vaccine stance doesn't bother you as a liberal, then his full-throated promotion of free market libertarian ideals should. Or his rabid defense of Israel, despite social media nods to known white supremacist code language. Or how he claimed he never said COVID-19 was genetically engineered to spare Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese people, even after a recording of him saying exactly that was released. I mean, seriously, f this guy. Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. And Jill Stein? I mean, stop. The election is a single day. Our activism has to be 24-7, 365. 
Pulling the lever for Biden is just an acknowledgement that we failed to make our demands heard and make demonstrable change in a system designed by and in favor of corporate oligarchs. Progressives are back to the drawing board. It is what it is. And voting for Biden is the lesser of two evils, by the way. There's no reason to call it anything else. In a few episodes lately, I've referenced the debate between Crystal Ball and Kyle Kalinske and Brianna Joy Gray, so hopefully you've had a chance to check it out if this debate is something you care about or you're tortured over having to make this decision come November. And I've said many times that I thought Crystal and Kyle were very well-reasoned and rational in their defense of Biden over Trump, but that it's almost like they couldn't see past their privilege to understand what Brianna was actually saying. And it's a privilege that I personally enjoy the fullest extent of the white American blue state privilege. Without rehashing it again, the upshot of Brianna's argument was that Biden may have prevented the utter collapse of democratic principles and norms, but he broke almost all of the promises that were made to black and brown communities and the working poor in this country. That there's no material difference between the Trump years and the Biden years to most people on the ground every day. And if we continue to fall for the lesser of two evils gag, then eventually everything will just be evil. And at what point do we draw the line? It's a mild form of accelerationist theory, but it's a sentiment that we really have to listen to closely because what you're hearing is an absence of hope. And hope is what brings people out and gets them to vote. They have to see themselves on the ballot. So what's the point of shouting at the rain? Well, Nathan Robinson made an excellent point in conversation with Ben Burgess recently. The idea among liberals and the establishment Democrats is that criticizing Biden serves to bolster Trump. Nonsense. If anything, we have to get louder in this moment. These are warning shots and wake-up calls. If riots are the language of the unheard, then let our protests and criticisms serve as policy beacons. Expressing our displeasure at the administration by threatening to pull our support or to simply sit out the election is exactly the way you accomplish change. Remember, voting is a moment in time on one day of the year. You want our support, Joe? No problem. We'll make it super easy. Don't just put your name on the ballot. Put us all on the ballot. Don't tell us that you've done so much already if we're telling you that we can't feel it. Tell us the 10 things you're going to do to improve the lives of the working class, the marginalized, the poverty-stricken, the homeless, the downtrodden, the middle class, the student, the veteran, the healthcare worker, the gig worker with three jobs taking care of her parents and trying to buy a home. Don't just scare us by saying that you've laid the foundation, so don't let the other guy tear it back down. Because whether it's a dirt lot or a dirt lot with a concrete foundation, it doesn't make a difference to us. We can't live there either way. It's up to you to help us see the vision. Joe, show us the plans to the house. You have the power to get rid of punitive PMI insurance on mortgages, to do more on student debt relief, and to refinance the rest of it, especially from private insurers. Stop blocking UN votes and demand a ceasefire in Gaza. Put a public option back on the table. Hell, put minimum wage back on the table. Threaten to stack the court like FDR did, or show us some legislative path forward to secure reproductive rights and bodily autonomy. Go on the offensive and browbeat the Federal Reserve like the other guy did, so that we can reduce rates and simultaneously produce a plan to go after monopolies and price gouging if you really want to see inflation go down. By the way, these ideas pull really fucking well with the public. They perform less well with groups like APAC and others, which begs the question, who are you working for? In the Burgess Robinson discussion, Ben Burgess played a clip of Crystal Ball being asked by a viewer whether or not she still supports Biden and stands by her position from the debate with Brianna. And here's what she had to say. Listen, I mean, all the arguments still stand. Like if you're looking at the domestic record, if you you know care about unions and the antitrust movement, like it's very clear Biden is better on those issues. But I certainly cannot in good faith look at any person in this country and tell them you should vote for a man who is um, supporting a genocide, shipping the bombs, unconditional support. Like, it's just too far. Heed what Crystal is saying here, Joe, because a minute ago you had her and now you don't. This isn't on us. We're telling you what we want. But let's go worst case scenario. Let's say he does nothing to change course. Why is it still better to vote for Biden in November, all things being equal? I'm going to give you two reasons. Two reasons outside of yourself. 
outside of the broken promises and the daily economic stress that overwhelms so many of us. Katanji Brown Jackson and the trans community. Even if Alito and Thomas live, what if Sotomayor doesn't? People die. Stranger things have happened. Can you imagine a 7-2 conservative majority in the Supreme Court? It'll take decades to unravel that. And by the way, KBJ may be Biden's crowning achievement, the single most qualified and progressive justice on the bench, hard stop. And if you have a trans person in your life, at work, among your friends, or in your family, then you're likely aware of the growing rates of violence against this community and the unprecedented amount of state and federal anti-trans legislation pending at the moment. A Trump administration would be catastrophic for this community. Call it holding your nose, the lesser of two evils, call it whatever you like. Most of what we want isn't on the menu. That's just preordained. The selections won't make a material difference to most of our lives because we've already handed the keys to our collective fate over to corporations who win either way in the grand scheme of things. But it will matter to someone you care about. So in that private moment, when you pull the lever or mail the ballot, you can do so with a clear conscience and a loving heart. Here endeth the meditation.